Hey guys, Jared Lutner here, Tackle Warehouse Pro Staff. You know, springtime. Everybody knows bass fishing is best in the springtime, and you know, it's it's my favorite time of year to fish. Sometimes my wife thinks that I'm never coming back home. It's it's the best time of year just because the fish are so active. You know, there's there's all different stages of the spawn happening. Pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn. Post -spawn. Within that month period, anywhere in the country during the spring, there's fish in all three stages. Um, you know, usually I have, I don't know, probably 25 rods rigged up on the deck, but there's always three main things that I have that I'm 100% confident in. No matter where I'm fishing at in the country in the spring, I'm gonna get bit on. Start off with, and this is a little unconventional, you know, because a lot of guys, again, are saying, you know, I'm gonna catch them on a soft stick bait, a fluke. I mean, there's so many different ways to catch them in the spring. I'm just gonna tell you three of my favorites. The Jackal Gavacho, little popping frog, you know, and, and everybody's thinking, well, man, that's more post-spawn. It's really, really not. Um, when those fish are pre-spawn and they're sitting up underneath maybe some weeds or a dock or, you know, under some laydowns, whatever it may be, they're sitting there sunning, getting ready to go and spawn, that's a real effective technique to catch them. Little popping frog, you know, you can walk it. Um, and it just gets in their kitchen, they can't stand it. They gotta eat it. Um, you know, generally speaking, I'm throwing white, but we make a color called gold gill in the gabacho that if the water's got some clarity to it, that's the deal. It's a little bluegill imitation. Um, you know, if the water's darker, like some of these places that I fish down in South Texas, the water's real dark, I'll go with the black one but always, always, always have a gavacho on or some sort of frog. Um, you're gonna get bit and a lot of times they're that big. Um, you know, the, the right gear for throwing this though is very, very essential. You, you have to have the right gear, otherwise you're gonna get yourself in trouble. I always throw 60 pound FX2 braid. Um, the rod is the Ritual Angling R2 Flip Frog Rod, uh, seven foot five. And you know, it's got a lot of backbone. Um, you know, because a lot of times you're gonna catch them in open water, but more often than not, if those fish are spawning back in the reeds or in some grass, or like I said, back in bushes, you gotta have that power, that backbone to drag them out of there. Um, and this here is the Daiwa Tatula SV. And that simply helps you eliminate backlash, you know, cause I'm skipping it, like I said, underneath the dock or skipping it underneath, you know, a, a walkway or whatever it may be, um, it's gonna help eliminate that backlash. Uh, you know, and, and the, all three of these techniques, I'm kind of targeting the same type of areas. You know, everybody knows, and you've all heard, spawning bays, right? That's all fine and dandy, and we all kind of know what we're looking for, but the way that I kind of process information is I'm trying to find something unique in that spawning bay. So if the whole bay is lined with, let's say, for lack of a better example, you know, this type of grass behind me, and then you've got a 15-yard stretch where there's just, say, reeds that's a high percentage area. Or, you know, if you know that lake really well and you know there's some rocks out in front of it. So I'm trying to get into those bays but really narrow it down based on the bottom structure that if I know, you know, like I said, if I know there's a gravel bar out here, I'm gonna go there and catch those fish because it's something different. And not everybody's looking at that, they're just going around the whole bay. So really kind of focus on the small details um, you know, and the irregularities in those bays, in, in those big areas, focus on a little area and you're gonna come upon the mother load. So anyway, let me get back to my, my lures I throw. So then I helped them design this. This here is an Eco Pro spinnerbait. It's got a tungsten head, which is, I mean, this is a half ounce spinnerbait right here. Uh, this here is actually a prototype, but I've caught several big fish on it. This past season, I weighed two of the biggest fish I caught during the Major League Fishing um, rounds on this spinnerbait right here, this exact one. I got one left and this is it. Uh, little kind of shaddy color. And I, what I like to do with these spinnerbaits, especially in the spring, is I put a little shad tail on there. This here's a 3.8 jackal rhythm wave in a shad color, kind of matches the skirt. And we have different blade combinations and, and uh, obviously different colors, you know, chartreuse and white. These shad type colors are really good in the spring. And again, I'm looking for those irregularities like I talked about with the Gavacho, but I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of fishing this thing like uh, kind of where I would want to fish a, a vibrating lipless bait, um, you know, 
but there's no grass or maybe it's just getting inundated. Everybody's throwing a, throwing a TN70 around me. I'm gonna pick up a spinner bait and fish in those same areas, those same depths, anywhere from one foot to say six, seven, eight feet, depending on what kind of lake you're at, what type of habitat you're fishing, and just kind of using a real slow, steady retrieve, you know, and, and I think the big thing, especially in the spring, is when I'm fishing and I'm winding it, I'll just give my rod a little pop. And what that's gonna do is make those blades jump. And when that happens, that's gonna entice a strike more often than not. So, you know, you just kinda gotta play around with it, play around with different retrieves, make accurate casts. And that's why I developed this rod. This here's a R2 Signature Series, seven foot five, medium heavy rod, pretty much for reaction baits. Um, it's got a nice soft tip, so you can place those casts accurately. Um, but then the backbone, the backbone you're gonna you know, you're going to get into them. So if I was throwing, say, a square bill or, uh, you know, a vibrating jig, same rod. But this is a really, really effective spinnerbait rod. Um, and again, just covering water. With, as far as the line, you know, depending on the clarity, depending on the type of structure. Like, if you see behind me here, we got grass, laydowns, different things. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to get kind of mixed up in. I'm going to throw a 20-pound shooter, sunline shooter. Now, if I'm fishing more open water, uh, you know, not as much structure and things like that, I'm gonna throw 16 pound shooter or the Crank FC. Um, so it kinda, it kinda, I let the conditions and the structure dictate what kind of line I'm throwing. Um, and then the reel, this here's a Daiwa Tattoo Elite, 6-3 gear ratio. And the reason I like that is because with a spinner bait, you don't want to overwork it and it's going to tumble. It, well, it has a possibility to tumble if you overwind it. You want to keep that bait moving nice and slow. So don't get in a big hurry with it. Kind of wind it around. You know, like I said, pump that rod, pop that rod, and then lay into them when you get bit. Um, and then kind of letting the cat out of the bag here. Again, everybody knows that California drop shot, right? Well. Years and years ago, you know, fishing some of the lakes we do, the California Delta, Clear Lake, some of my home lakes, springtime, fish are up, spawning all three phases, and you're throwing six or eight pound tests back in a tree, back in a bush, you get your feelings hurt, they break you off, you get angry, you retie, you get broke off again. And I'm like, why not just put it on a heavier line? So I kinda, I don't know if anybody used this term yet officially, but this is like the power shot. And if you think about it, it's much like pitching, say, a, a jig or a creature style bait, except the bait is elevated, obviously, up off the bottom, and it's kind of in their face. So when a fish is spawning, if you think about it, the fish is off the bottom that pretty much that far, and your bait, if you're throwing, say, a creature bait, your bait's laying on the bottom. It's not right there in its face. So you have to do a lot of work, and I, I just think it's something different um, than your standard like I said, creature bait, jig, hitting the bottom, doing that kind of deal. So the power shot, the way I rig it is I got a trocar, three-aught straight shank hook with this keeper on there. You can see this keeper. It's just a little plastic keeper. It really holds that worm in there. And because and, you're, again, you're pitching, flipping back into cover. I mean, I'm not using this to throw out in the middle of the lake, fish offshore. I am flipping where I would be flipping a jig. Um, so the hook is very, very important. Three aught, it's got the strength. So I'm using heavier line um, and a quarter ounce Eco Pro full contact drop shot weight. Again, line, if I'm fishing soft cover like grass and stuff like that, I'm gonna go 14 or 16 pound shooter by Sunline. I go all the way up to 25 pound shooter. Uh, it, it just depends on the situation. You know, if I'm, if I'm in say South Texas at Lake Fork, I'm not gonna throw 16 pound line in mesquite trees. I'm gonna throw probably 25. Actually, I'd probably do a, a 60 pound FX2 braid to a 25 pound test shooter leader. I mean, so it kind of, let the conditions, let the structure dictate what line you are throwing. Um, I usually, generally, that's about the length of the, of the leader on the drop shot. Anywhere from six to 12 inches, just like that. The quarter ounce, allows you to effectively, you know, whether you're in, let's say, three feet all the way to 10 foot, you've got a really good feel for that. You can feel logs, rocks, whatever you may be. And then that, with that 
tungsten also, it's really gonna help you detect those bites. Now with the rod, I played around with this a lot. At first I wanted a real heavy stout rod like my frog flip rod and I broke off some fish just because I was, had too much power in that rod. So I went to the 7'5 R2 uh, ritual angling casting rod. And for me, you know, it just has that right combination. Um, it's got enough backbone, enough power, but it also, when you're, you know, a lot of times I'm flipping from here to that tree right there, which is 15 feet from me. So when you hit them, you can, you're gonna break them off if you only got that, that amount of line out and you got too heavy of a rod. So having the right rod is really, really essential. A medium heavy, you know, let the length, whatever length you want, but just make sure it's medium heavy. Um, and Daiwa Tattoo Elite throwing a high speed, eight to one. And the reason being is, is you know how it is in the spring. You'll flip up in there, <coughs> one eats it, it's on a bed, and that sucker might be 10 feet to your left before you even know you got bit. And you gotta pick up that line really quick, set the hook, and then, you know, I've done this my whole life and some guys think I'm crazy. I got, I set my drags kind of tight, but what I'll do is, is if I got a big one on, I just thumb it, right? Keep pressure on that and let them do the work as I'm loosening up my drag. Cause I think it's so essential, especially the way you're Texas rigging a worm. You got to drive that hook through that plastic and get it and get penetration into those fish's mouth. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of different nuances with this technique. You can't just tie it on and throw it and set the hook and you're gonna catch them. You gotta really pay attention to details and think about what has to happen for you to land that fish. Now, let me talk about baits real quick. Robo worm, this here's a, a six inch straight fat tail robo worm, Aaron's Magic. Um, it's one of my go-tos in the spring, you know, and, and again, it's similar to the spinner bait. So I'm letting the water color dictate the colors of my bait. If I'm in real clear water, I'm gonna throw something more natural, like this, I don't know, it kind of represents a bluegill, a little baby bass, there's many different things. If I'm in darker water, like at, say for example, Lake Conroe in South Texas, it's dark water, you can barely see the tops of stumps, I'm throwing more of a reddish or something a little more bright, like a margarita mutilator color. Um, I've caught them on creature style baits, like little uh, brush hogs or jackal chunk craws, um, there's, there's an endless variety. It doesn't have to be a robo worm. It could be whatever your favorite bait is really to, uh, to fish. And you just Texas rig it, put it on a drop shot, heavier line, the right rod, the right reel. And I'm sorry to myself because you guys are gonna catch all the fish that I would be if, you know, if I didn't mention this. But here's another really cool little tip. So the frustrating part for me got to be Okay, I'm gonna to run to the next spot. Well, I have to undo my robo worm and put it on my thing and do all this. Just do this with your weight. You put it right here between the star, the little star drag and that knob and it holds it right there. Now you lay it on the deck, you pick it up, click your bail, let some line out, and there you go, you're ready to go. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to mess around with your worm. It all stays together, a nice little package. You're really efficient, really effective and uh, you're good to go. You're gonna whack them this spring, man. Make sure and check out all the gear. It's available right now at tacklewarehouse.com and I'll see you on the water this spring. You never know where we're gonna be.